welcome to our Sabbath School class. My name is Robert Blaze and I'll be studying scripture with you this quarter. And we have a, an amazing lesson to study this quarter. It is how to interpret scripture. We will be looking at the origin of the Bible. We're gonna talk about how to understand it, how to interpret it, but most importantly, we're gonna be looking at the power that it has to change your life and mine, right here on ADTV. Welcome back to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School. I'm glad you've joined us once more as we begin a new quarter. We'll be studying a new topic and I'm really excited because we'll be looking at scripture. So without wasting any more time, let us pray. Father, we come to you thankful. Father, you've gotten us through our first quarter this year. You've gotten us through our week and we are now here ready to open your word and to study. And so Father, I pray and I ask that you be our teacher that your Holy Spirit be the one guiding us into all truth, for we know, Father, we cannot on our own. I pray especially, Lord, that you be with me, that you put your words in my mouth and that my lips utter nothing, Lord, that is not from you. And I pray that everything we will hear will be from you. I pray, Father, that I may not be seen, but Jesus be seen and heard, and that we may be drawn closer to you, and that a desire for your word may be ignited in us even more. Father, if there's any sin that you see in us at this time, I ask and I pray for your forgiveness, for your cleansing. Give us, Lord, I pray, the righteousness of Christ. And I thank you and I pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. I, our title this week is The Uniqueness of the Bible. And I'd like to ask you to turn to our memory text in the book of Psalm, chapter 119. It's a very uh, famous verse in verse 105. It reads, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Simply says, it means that the scripture, the Bible, the word of God is to direct every facet of our lives. Too often we, we think that we can on our own way with our own thinking, with our own mind, our own decision making, know what is the best course of action. But truly, if we would only follow what scripture has to say, we would be in the best path for our lives. And today we will be looking at why the Bible is so unique. So we'll break down our topic today in two ways. So we'll be studying the scriptures, but specifically we're going to look at uh, what is the Bible. And also, um, we're going to be looking at, importantly, the power of the Word. So this is how our topic will be broken down today. Our lesson actually gives us a very good introduction, so I'll be reading it from page six. It says, the, the, speaking of the Bible, composed of 66 books and written over 1,500 years on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, by over 40 authors, the Bible is unique. There is no other book, sacred or religious like it, and no wonder, after all, it is the Word of God. There are over 24,600 extant New Testament manuscript from the first four centuries after Christ. Of Plato's original manuscript, there are seven, Herodotus, eight, and Homer's Iliad, slightly more with 263 surviving copies. Hence, we have powerful confirming evidence of the integrity of the New Testament text. The Bible was the first book known to be translated, the first book in the West published on the printing press, and the first book to be so widely distributed in so many languages that it can be read by 95% of the Earth's population today. The Bible is unique, and the Bible is also very interesting. The Bible is, uh, the, the word Bible means book. It is the book of book. But the Bible is actually a collection. It's actually a collection 
of two collections. It is a collection of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. These are also two collections. And I, I emphasize that because the Bible is a collection of authoritative books and not an authoritative collection of books. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that it is not the fact that the books were put together that, gave, that, that it gives it authority. See, the books already had authority on their own, by themselves, singularly. And putting them together did not give them anything extra or anything more powerful. And that's an important uh, difference to understand. You see, the church at Rome, for example, claims that the author they have authority above the Bible because they put the Bible together. They gave it its authority, but that's actually not accurate. Those who put the Bible together actually simply acknowledge that the books were already authoritative in their life, that they, they, they already believed them to be the Word of God. And so all that they did is they said, oh yes, this book Yes, this book is authoritative, and no, not this book, but this book, and this book, and this book. And that's why they made it in uh, the Bible. So putting them together didn't give them any power. So the emphasis is always important that the authority is on the books of the Bible and not on the collection. So now when we look, for example, at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is actually the Tanakh. That is the Hebrew scripture. The Tanakh is actually an acronym of three different words. First, you have the Torah, which is known as the law, which is the first five books of Moses. And then you have the Nevi'im. Okay. So the Nevi'im is actually the prophets. Let me put that down here. So you have the writings of the prophets. This is the writing of the law, specifically the books of Moses. And finally, the last part is the Ketuvim. And the Ketuvim is poetry. So this is where we find the Psalms, the Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, and the likes. These are the books from the Old Testament. In the New Testament, which is written in the Greek, there's different books. For example, there's historical book. So you have the Gospels, you have uh, letters of uh, the apostles, you have uh, the book of Acts, rather. The book of Acts is part of the historical books. You have some letters, the letters of Paul and the letter of James. These are letters that were written specifically at, at diverse churches or persons. You also have prophecies. Now, prophecies are interesting. We've talked a little bit more about it in our last quarter, but you have two types of prophecy. You have apocalyptic prophecies. Now, apocalyptic means that they deal with the end time, specifically, and they also are unconditional, meaning it's going to happen no matter what. And then the other one is classical prophecies. Now, classical prophecies are more in the immediate, few years, few hundred years, but they are under condition, meaning that they may happen or may not happen depending if the conditions are met. And, and you have a, l a little bit of an idea how the Bible is broken down. Like we said earlier, it has been written over 1,500 years by more than 40 authors. The Old Testament contains 39 books, while the New Testament contains 27 for a total of 66 books. Now, those 40 authors are, are very interesting because a lot of them didn't know each other. In fact, most of them lived hundreds of years apart, and yet the Bible is coherent. It's in harmony. It agrees with each other, even if the authors had never met. Why is that? How can this be? I mean, people on their own have a hard time agreeing with what they said yesterday. Now imagine on the span of hundreds and, and thousands of years. Well, in the Bible, in 2 Timothy 3.16, we read that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You see, you may have many writers, but you have one author, and the author is God. And through 
inspiration, he moved upon different people for them to write that which God had impressed on their mind. Now, it's true that when this verse was written, the only thing that was scripture was actually the Old Testament. But it says all scripture and the New Testament is scripture. It is inspired. It is the word of God. Therefore, this verse definitely applied to both the Old and the New Testament without problem. Now, what makes it also very interesting is when you think about all these different authors, they come from very different background. They wrote at very different time under various circumstances. And I like to look at quite a few of them. So let's think, for example, Moses. Moses, an important character. Now, Moses was actually a prince. He was a prince because, according to Exodus 2.10, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him as a son. But when he left Egypt, he became a shepherd. And as a shepherd, he actually wrote the book of Job when he was in the uh, desert in Midian. And his first five books, the, most of his book, he wrote while he was in the wilderness. He was, being, uh, he was leading Israel. So he was in the wilderness. He was a leader of a great congregation. That's when he wrote all those laws and, and all those ceremonial laws. Somebody like Amos. Amos was a prophet, but we read in Amos 7.14, he says, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. He was a farmer, right? He had no background when it came to prophecy, yet God called him to write and to be a prophet. You have another prophet, somebody like Jeremiah. Now, in Jeremiah 1, verse 1, we read that he was the son of Elkiah, of the priests. So he was the son of a priest. Now, keep in mind, these two, though they were prophet, they weren't schooled in the school of the prophet. They were not educated to be prophet. And yet, God, and especially when you look at Jeremiah, chose these people. It says, Jeremiah himself says, I am but a child in verse 6, and yet God chose him specifically to be a prophet. Think of uh, Luke. We wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. In Colossians 4.14, he's called the beloved physician. Luke was a doctor. He was educated, but in anatomy and in helping people and in healing people. And yet he's considered to be the first historian because the way that he gathered his information is amazing. The way he uh, got dates and got historical people all fitting through his story is, is amazing. He was a doctor and he was a historian. He wrote by first gathering some documents, but he also was traveling with Paul. And as he was traveling with Paul, he wrote of his uh, experience. Let's think of David. Now, we all know David as a king, but David didn't start as a king. David started as a shepherd. And then he was a soldier. He was then a general. Then he finally became a king. He also was a fugitive when he was running away from Saul or when he was running away from his son. And David, despite all of these things, what he wrote were psalms, were poetry, was song. He was further uh, above all things. He was a musician. Uh, let's think of John, known as John the Revelator. John was known as the son of thunder, meaning he had, a, he had an attitude. He had a, an anger problem. He was always angry. But later on, he's known as the apostle of love. He was actually a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos for his faith. And it is then at that time that he received visions of what would come to pass, of uh, what we have now as the book of Revelation. He only, of course, wrote it a lot later when he was um, ministering to church member after uh, they actually tried to boil him alive in oil. 
that didn't work, so they, they sent him in prison. Uh, let's think now of Daniel. Daniel is another prophet. Now, Daniel is another fantastic character. He's actually a prince. We read in Daniel 1.3 that he was from the king's seeds and of the prince. But Daniel was actually a slave. He was a slave, and yet he became a high court official while he was in captivity. So he was highly educated, very smart, but he was still a slave. And he wrote, of course, the whole book of Daniel, where we get a lot of apocalyptic prophecies, uh, which we studied last quarter. Think of Matthew, Matthew Levi. In, in the book of Matthew, verse 99, we read that Matthew was sitting at the receipt of custom. He was a tax collector, which means he was also a thief because he collected ta tax. And, and that is why he was very much hated from his compatriot, from the Jews, because he was, serving, um, he, was, he was serving the people that were oppressing them, the Romans. And yet he wrote one of the nicest, most beautiful gospel, the book of Matthew, which is the first book you find in the New Testament. We have Paul. How can we not talk about Paul? Who was Paul? He, gives, he says himself in Philippians 3, in verse 3 to 6, you have his, his whole uh, resume there. He says he was a Pharisee. But furthermore, in verse 6, he says that he was persecuting the church. He was a persecutor. He hated the church. He wanted it to be destroyed. He hated Christ. He hated the apostles. He hated Christianity. And yet he had an experience. And he became the greatest after Jesus, evangelist and teacher ever. And it's very interesting because he also wrote most of the New Testament. And the last person I would like to talk about is Ezra. Now, Ezra was a priest and a scribe. And he wrote while they were trying to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple where they were trying to escape captivity, but they never did. They remained captive. And Ezra is another one of those people that wrote. Now, this is just a sample of all those people that wrote the Bible. There's a lot more. And you see the diversity, the background, the temperament, the education of these different writers. And yet, uh, despite the condition and where they live and what they wrote, everything in the Bible is coherent and in harmony. Why? Because though they were writing, God was the author. God was making sure that everything was exactly what it ought to be. So that's a little bit what the Bible is all about. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the power of the Bible. We're going to need a bit of space here. So now I'd like to ask you to go with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32. These are some of the last words of Moses. Beginning in verse 45, he says something amazing. He says, and Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said unto them, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which you shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing, you shall prolong your days in the land whether you go over Jordan to possess. So Moses in Deuteronomy 32 tells us that the word gives life or is life. And then he says that the word prolongs life. But of course, for these two things to happen, there's a condition. And what's the condition? To do, which means obedience, which means doing what the word says we ought to do. Now, 
In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus expressed it in a different way, meaning the same thing. He says, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus also says in, in John 6, 63, the word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The word of scripture and the word of Jesus has life. Even Peter in John 6, 68, was forced to declare, thou hast the word of eternal life. And in the, the previous chapter of, of John, in John 5, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and he said to them, you search the scripture, for in them ye think you have eternal life. He says you search, that's in, in John 5, he says you search the scripture, why? Because they think that in them they have eternal life. Now note that Jesus, Jesus does not rebuke them for thinking that eternal life is in the scripture, but then he tells them, but it is they that testify of me. And so we see a, a clear connection between the scripture and Jesus. And he goes on saying in the next verse, and ye will not come to me that you might have life. Jesus says, the scripture that you search, that you think gives eternal life, points to me, but you're not coming to me. If we come to Jesus, we can have eternal life. Very, very important. But now there's a question that arises. How? Can the word give life? How can Jesus give life? Well, for this, we need to search the scripture. And I'd like to invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. We'll read verse 16 and 17. Speaking of Jesus, it says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, keep that in mind. Very important. Colossians 1, verse 16, 17, we read that through Jesus all things were created. And then he goes on saying, not only were all things created, but all things consist because of him. So not only did he bring things into existence, but they remain in existence because of him. Now let's turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. We get a, a little bit more detail. In Hebrews 1, um, it's talking about Jesus, and, and at, the end, at the end of verse 2, it says that, by whom also he made all the worlds. So, he made, this is in Hebrews chapter 1, he made all things. And then when you continue down the verse, in verse 3, it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things. So he upholds all things. All right, which is the same thing here as consists and the same thing as made. But here, Jesus is going to add, or, or rather Paul is going to add a little something about Jesus. He says, upholding all things by the word of his power. So the power of the word of Jesus is what creates all things and what upholds all things. So by the word, Jesus keeps everything together. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 1. This is going to be amazing. Genesis 1 beginning in verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. How did God create? In Genesis 1.1, we read that God created by his word. He spoke and it happened. So that tells us two things. A, that the word has power. Amazing power. And B, what kind of power? It has creative power. That's the type of power that the Word of God has. Now, watch this. When God spoke, let there be light. What kind of, um, what kind of word, what kind of speaking was that? In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, we read, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shine in our heart. When he said, let there be light. What was he doing? He was commanding. Before he gave the command, where was the light? The light didn't exist. The light wasn't there. So what did he command the light that did not exist to do? He commanded the light to exist. So God commanded the light that did not exist to exist. And what was the result? It came into existence. So when the light that did not exist heard the command to exist and came into existence, what did the light do? It obeyed. <laughs> Listen, the first thing, the first thing that ever came into existence responded while it was yet inexistent by obeying. That is how powerful the Word of God is. That's what creative power does. It commands things that do not exist to obey and to come into existence. That is incredible. In John 1, verses 1 to 4, we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. So obviously, we, we already know this is Jesus. And without Him was not anything that was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of the man. The Word that create is the Word that sustain and is the Word that gives life, and that's Jesus. In verse 14, we read that that word was made flesh. That's Jesus. That's why Jesus has life. Because he is the author of life. He has the power to give life. He has the power of creation. And the scripture is his word. So in a real sense, there's power there. Because that's the words of Jesus. But what's the condition for life? It's obedience. It's always been that. Listen, whoever you are, wherever you are, and whatever you're going through, you can have the life that Jesus offers. No matter how weak you are, no matter how bad you think you are, no matter how terrible the conditions around you are, it doesn't matter because the power is in the word you listen to the word you obey the word and the power comes it it doesn't come from me and it doesn't come from you we are actually powerless listen if something that do not exist can obey and come into existence imagine you who already exists you can obey and follow God, because the power is in the Word, not in us. It's outside of us, and that's good news, because I know I'm weak, 
and I, I can't do this. I can't do any of this. And I'm sure you feel the same way. But the power is in the word of God. From creation to recreation, from life to eternal life, the power is in the word and the condition has always been and always will be the same. Obedience. Let me share a story for you from, from scripture. As this young king, his name was Josiah. I love Josiah. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And Josiah came to the throne very early and he really tried to do the will of God. He did the best that he could. And one day we read in 2 Kings and we read the story in, verse, in chapter 22. It says that Helkiah the high priest sent unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Now there's a question that, that comes to your mind is, what have they been doing all this time if they didn't have the book of the law? And so they were just going on tradition. Whatever had been done before then, they were just continuing to do it. But now they found the book of the law. And so they told, um, Shaphan told him, go show it to the king. Go show that book to the king. And Shaphan read it before the king. And in verse 11, we read, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rented his clothes. He was so distraught because he realized everything that was written in the book and everything that they were supposed to, to do and how much they had fallen short, how much they had fallen behind, how much they were actually not following the word of God. And he was so distraught. In verse 13, he says, Go ye inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. You see, when Josiah heard these words, he didn't, pff, nonsense, this is ridiculous. No, no, no. He heard the word and he was distraught. It tugged at his heart. He says, we need to find out. We need to know what these words are. We need to make sure because otherwise we're in trouble. And yes, they were in trouble. And so we read in verse 14 that they went to all the, the prophetess. You know, it's good to have the word of a prophet or a prophetess to help us through the Bible. And so they went to her. And in verse 15, we read that she said unto them, Thus said the Lord of Israel, tell the man that sent you to me. You, you've come to me now. Now these are the words that I want you to deliver to King Josiah. Thus said the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Chusa has read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Wherefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard. And, and listen to these words. Because thine heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitant thereof and that they should become a desolation and a curse and has rent thy clothes and wept before me I also have heard thee said the Lord behold therefore I will gather thee unto thy fathers and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. When Josiah heard the word, he sent to inquire. And the response that he got is, those words are true. Those words are from God. Yes, the people have rebelled. Yes, they have apostatized. And yes, disaster is coming upon them. But you, you were tender in your heart. You were distraught as what you heard. And therefore, because of that, it's not going to come in your days. You don't have to worry. Now, if you were Josiah, you could have been, oh, well, that's good to know. I can now relax. 
I can go easy. But that's not what Josiah did. As he heard these words, the greatest reformation in Israel that ever took place began. He removed all the false worship. He brought the people back to the worship of God. He did everything that he could, and he followed the word. And Israel prospered during that time because they followed the word that they heard. Because the word has power. It gave a new life to Israel. It gave a new life to the king. They thought they were doing what was right, but then they, they looked at the word and then they knew what they had to do so that they, so that they could do what was right. And there's many other examples of this, how the word changed people. Think of Saul, not the king, the one who became Paul. Saul, as I said earlier, he was a Pharisee. He, he hated the church. He wanted to destroy the church. He was so well-versed in the scripture, but all he had was this intellectual knowledge. And he hated Jesus. He hated the apostle. He hated everything that they were doing. And he set out to destroy the church single-handedly. He would, he would get letters from the, um, from the synagogues, you know, endorsing him in his quest for revenge. He would drag people in the street. He would drag them to, to be persecuted, to be killed, and, and to be sent to prison. And then one day, he had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And when he had that encounter... He was blinded and he spent three days with no sight, alone. He didn't eat. He spent it in prayer. And everything that he knew, because now he had met Jesus and all the scripture, all the truth that he had known, finally made sense to him. And on that day, he was changed. From Saul the persecutor to Paul the evangelist. He spent two years with the brethren studying the scripture, putting things together, and then he began preaching, and he, he actually planted most of the church in Asia, in, in Asia Minor at the time. He wrote half of the New Testament, if not more. He became so well-known and so well-respected. The word changed his life. Today, I'd like to suggest to you that that same word that changed nations, that brought revival and reformation, that changed a man like Paul, that empowered the church, that, that revolutionized everything. That word has power and can have power in your life. It can have power in my life and in your life, and all that there is to do is when we read it and when we see it and when we understand that we follow it. That word is from God. That word is from divine origin and changes life and empowers people. And I'd like to encourage you, not only today, and, but every day, and especially this quarter, as we study the scripture in depth, what it is all about, that you will spend time with it, that you may know the will of God for your life. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we want to thank you this day for having had the chance to look very broadly and, and, and very largely at the Scripture, at what it is and, and what it can do. And Father, as, as, we, as we are moved, as we are convicted, as our, our heart is being challenged, that Lord, you will help us as we desire to look into this Word and find out, Lord, what you want for us, what you want from us, how we ought to be living our lives in these days. Lord, we are in a, in a time of, of high interest where things are moving very strangely. There, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of, of things that don't make sense. And yet, Father, your word Speak to us about these times. I pray, Lord, that we will desire to submit to you, for you will guide us through these times. And then one day, one day you will come and you will bring us home. And so, Father, I ask that you give us the power that is in the word to obey and to follow. 
And I thank you, Father, for having given us such a word of power. And I pray this in the man who spoke these very words, the man who gave us the power through his word, that is Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen.